and welcome to the Consumer Safety and Public Health panel. My name is Kara Laveau. I'm a food, and safe, food safety and marijuana supervisor for the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment. And I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, we have two local health departments represented today, Denver Local Health Department and the Los Angeles County Health Department. So just to introduce our panelists, next to me is Bill Bennerman. He is also with my same department, the local health department here in Denver. He works in our environmental quality division as the emergency response coordinator. So hello to Bill. And next to Bill is Terry Williams. Terry Williams is the director of environmental health for the Los Angeles County Health Department in California. So hello to Terry. So uh, we are going to start our panel discussion today with a few slides, just a few. We have 10 in total. So Bill and I will go through our slides for the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment, and then Terry's up for her slides for Los Angeles County. Then we have some questions prepared to present to the panel. And then at the, towards the end, we'll allow 20 minutes or so for audience questions and answers. So uh, I'm going to kick it off with an introduction to the agency that I work for which is the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment. We're a large department. We've got seven divisions right now, and we're, we have really varied divisions. So we're everything from the coroner's office to animal protection and control. We've got environmental quality where Bill works. We have public health inspections where I work, uh, community health, behavioral health, sustainability. We're a large department with various public health interests. So within the division that I work in, which is public health inspections, we're divided into two sections. So we kind of like to say we have two halves of the house. So I'm on the food safety and marijuana side, so it's pretty clear what our, what our focus is and what we do. So we inspect food and, and marijuana facilities. Our other side of the house does everything else that you would associate with the field of environmental health. Pool inspections, housing inspections, um, noise, lead, body art, so on and so forth. So that's just a glimpse of our agency. Uh, let me see, did I miss this one? Okay. So we're quite busy in, in Denver. We have a lot of marijuana facilities in Denver. Right now we're sitting at about 1,100 different licenses, and those make up about 500 brick and mortar facilities. So we are inspecting all 500 of those places. So our food and marijuana team, we inspect the dispensaries and the manufacturing facilities. And then it's Bill's team that inspects the cultivation facilities. So these licenses can be made up of retail and rec. Um, and then we also have two somewhat new licenses in Colorado for social consumption and for transport licenses. One of the questions that we are always asked in Denver is, what sort of public health challenges have we faced? Um, how has our pro program evolved? What have we identified as public health challenges and issues as we've moved through our regulatory program? So this is kind of going to be one of the focuses of our panel discussion today. So um, this slide just kind of talks about the six big areas of public health challenges that we've kind of worked through. Really one of the first was equipment. When we first started inspecting manufacturing facilities, as you can imagine, some of these operators did not come from food safety backgrounds. So we were faced with you know, some crazy issues out there. We had a facility making water hash in a washing machine, like a domestic washing machine. So that actually resulted in Denver's first recall of marijuana product. So it was just an old domestic Maytag rusty and moldy washing machine. So, you know, just some, some, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know at the time. So that was one of the first challenges that we faced. Um, you can imagine we walk into a manufacturing facility and it's quite, quite different than walking into a food facility. So we're faced with looking at extraction equipment and it doesn't have nice, neat UL labels on there or an NSF label. So we're going back to some basic public health principles and standards of us evaluating, is this a cleanable piece of, mach of machinery? How do you clean this? How often do you clean this? So we're kind of going back to basics with some of this equipment type stuff. Um, if any of you were here for our previous panel, Danica, our director, touched on some of the contamination issues that our agency has worked through. Um, pesticides were a big, big one. So that really took up a lot of our time in 2015 and 16. So we did a number of recalls. I think overall we're at about 80 recalls now for various contamination of product. Pesticides was a big one. Um, this year and last year, we've been looking at more microbial contamination issues have been popping up this year. 
So a contaminated product making its way to consumer shelves is something that we look at and something that we've dealt with as a local health agency. Added ingredients is another thing that we've looked at. So Danica had mentioned earlier that Denver is a home rule jurisdiction. Um, we do operate under our own code. And so we can take a look at public health issues with things that are not foods. So smoking products, vaping products. And this is something as our program has evolved that we've looked at. So what are some of the ingredients being added to these smoking and vaping products? Are these healthy to consume? You know, is it a public health concern that you're smoking great food flavoring in your vape pen? You know, is that a public health concern? Um, so this kind of segues nicely into, you know, we would look at, at similar products. What's a similar product to a vape pen? You think of e-cigarettes. So we would look at to the FDA. How are they evaluating these different ingredients being added to e-cigarettes? Um, you know, they're kind of in the same boat that we are. They're looking at these things currently, actually, and trying to evaluate the ingredients in e-cigarettes. The federal oversight piece, that's a challenge. I mean, that's a pretty obvious challenge, but that's a pretty big darn challenge. So it really puts a local health agency such as ours in sometimes in an awkward position. Um, you know, we're a local health department. We like to have the answers. We like to provide good customer service to our operators. And it's hard when we have, you know, a manufacturer that calls us up and says, hey, local health department, I'd like to start putting vitamin C in my gummies. Is that a problem? <laughs> you know, and it's hard because we have to say, I don't know. You know, they say, well, how much can we put in there? You know, it's, it's really hard. We spend a lot of time on FDA's website trying to figure these questions out because we don't have the answers to this. And this is, some of these product evaluations really put us outside of our comfort zone. This is not something that we are asked when we inspect a Chili's. So it's just a little bit of a different situation for us to be in. Um, Hemp-derived products. Hemp is a, is a huge industry right now, currently exploding. Um, hemp products in general really pose just a basic approved source issue for us. Um, you know, marijuana products are easy to track. They're all in Colorado. Um, the metric system, the state seed to sale tracking system makes it easy for us to trace it back to the manufacturer, tra trace it back to the cultivation. Hemp is a completely different ballgame. So we can go into a manufacturing facility, for example, and they may be adding a CBD ingredient to their gummy products, for example. Um, you know, our inspectors have come across just a mason jar of hemp oil, and there's no label, there's no invoice. Um, that is a basic approved source issue for us. Any food ingredient put into a food needs to come from an approved source, meaning that it's under some type of health and sanitation regulation. So the hemp industry is booming right now. The barrier to entry in the hemp industry is low. So we've seen a lot of people just jumping into this industry. The um, regulation for hemp is very patchwork. The legality of hemp is very murky and very confusing from state to state. And you know, it's just, hemp is kind of a headache for us right now. And our last kind of challenge that we've worked through is just basic food safety issues with marijuana and hemp products. Um, as you can imagine, there's very little science for us to go to, like we have in the food world. Uh, we don't know how pathogens grow on marijuana. So because we don't know that information, we've taken a very cautious approach with what we consider to be a potentially hazardous food. And by that, I mean a food that, that requires temperature control, time control to keep the public safe. So we've kind of taken a, a cautious approach in Denver and have said that all um, marijuana oils, um, tinctures, beverages require refrigeration. And really that is to, to keep the, the public safe. Um, the the um, pathogen of concern with these is Clostridium, bot Clostridium botulinum. So botulism. Uh, we don't know if this is an issue, but it could be an issue because it's plant material. In the food world, we would look at something like a fresh garlic and oil. Um, that is a product that could carry a botulism risk. So we've taken those same food safety principles that we're very familiar with and have the science to back in the food world, and we tried to apply this to the cannabis world. So that, that's just a very general overview of some of the um, kind of bigger challenges that we've worked through in our regulation program. Ah, Bill's up. Uh, thanks, Kara. Again, Bill Bennerman with uh, Denver Department of Public Health and Environment. I'm in our Environmental Quality Division, 
And our focus around marijuana um, is on the clean air, um, clean water, clean land kind of, kind of perspective. Um, when we first started looking at um, marijuana, our, the grow facilities were our, our largest um, area of concern. Um, and we were looking initially at things around um, the, the types of waste that they generate and how they're, they're managing their waste. So um, the grow facilities, especially when the industry w was just beginning and, and um, um, kind of learning how to uh, be a, a business, uh, they weren't aware of a lot of the environmental regulations around um, hazardous waste and special waste. Um, significant for us was um, uh, how, how to manage lighting waste, um, spent lamps and spent ballasts, uh, those kinds of things. Um, we also had a lot of concerns about um, wastewater from the grow facilities. In a lot of cases, they were permitted to discharge their water to our sanitary system, but not to our storm system. And a lot of these facilities in the early days didn't really have a good understanding of, of where their um, drains went to. So they knew they had a drain and they knew the water went somewhere and, and that took care of their problem. But um, there are a lot of regulatory requirements around discharge of uh, wastewater from, from a, a commercial facility and trying to help um, the industry understand the difference and, and make sure they were properly discharging wastewater was one of our concerns. Um, we also did a number of things around sustainability. So um, grow facilities uh, require a lot of um, electricity. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of outreach um, efforts around sustainability things. Are there alternatives to um, the lighting systems that they're using that are, that are more energy efficient, those kinds of things. The, um, by far the biggest concern for us, um, especially with the grow facilities, um, is uh, the nuisance odor. So when uh, marijuana was first legalized, um, we started to get community concerns around the odor from grow facilities. Um, and it finally got to the point where city, our city council passed a, an o, uh, ordinance around nuisance odor. And um, it listed a number of different business types that were required to um, comply with this ordinance. Um, that ordinance required um, facilities to uh, have an approved odor control plan in place. Um, and marijuana grow facilities as well as MIPS um, were two of those industries listed. It al also included uh, wastewater treatment facilities, uh, pet manufacturing facilities, um, and um, certain petroleum um, uh, materials were, inquired, were required to have odor control plans. Um, so after the ordinance was passed, we developed some Denver-specific rules and regulations around odor control plans and kind of spelled out what we wanted to see in those plans. And um, a key component of that was um, because this is a new industry and this is a new field, um, we wanted to have an industrial hygienist or a certified um, professional engineer um, sign a statement that they believe that um, the plan was going to reduce odors, uh, marijuana odors, to the extent possible. Marijuana odor is, is a really challenging um, field for us, it's new. There's not a lot of research into what actually it is about marijuana that, that causes the odor. Um, we're learning a lot and we have some pretty good ideas about the actual chemical constituents that, that generate that, that um, odor that everybody knows. And um, until you can identify the chemical constituents, it's hard to really identify the best technology to reduce odor. Um, we have identified a number of technologies that seem to work very well. And um, almost all of our facilities at this point have an, a, an approved odor control plan in place. And um, it's still too early to really have some, some quantifiable data, but there's um, definitely a, um, an improvement in the odor um, around town, um, as well as the number of environmental complaints um, that we receive around nuisance odor from grow facilities. We also require uh, odor control plans for uh, MIPS. Um, in most cases, uh, MIPS, if they're not doing, um, if they're just using um, oils and, and um, they're not doing any um, baking with, with any actual marijuana leaves, 
Um, very, very low potential for odor, but we still um, uh, do get uh, complaints about it every now and again. Again, um, for the hazardous waste side of things, this is uh, st uh, state regulations, state and federal regulations, although um, at the local level we, um, we do enforce on those. And so again, spent lighting from these grow facilities is a significant concern for us. So it's managing these, way, um, um, these light bulbs appropriately and understanding um, the quantities of lamps, waste lamps that you can generate at your facility and store at your facility and making sure that you're using a, an improved um, uh, transportation disposal facility for them. Spent light ballasts also um, have some regulatory requirements and so those have to be managed as well. And one of, um, one of the big concerns we had early on, and, and as the industry's matured, we see a lot less of this, but um, just general housekeeping around hazardous material storage. So um, these facilities were, were um, using a lot of different chemicals for a variety of reasons, everything for, from just keeping the facility clean um, to pesticides and herbicides. Um, and just really sloppy housekeeping. So acids and bases were being stored in the same cabinet or right next to each other and unla unlabeled bottles, um, really no inventory, uh, material safety sheets um, on each of those chemicals weren't present in the facility. So we did a lot of outreach on just um, how to properly store hazardous materials and, and um, properly keep them labeled and, and identification, those kinds of things. And again, uh, we talked briefly about the wastewater management issue. So um, simple things like um, taking uh, your trays in between, um, in between cycles out into the driveway to wash them out with, with the hose and soapy water, you know, that goes down our, into our storm system and, and that's just something that's not allowed. So a lot of, a lot of outreach and just understanding, again, about knowing where uh, your drains are going, where that uh, wastewater is going. Turn over to Terry. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Terry Williams. I'm the Director of Environmental Health for the Department of Public Health for Los Angeles County. And I had to smile, Kara, when you said Denver Public Health is a large department because I suspect that LA County is the largest um, health department of anybody in this room um, and environmental health. So I kind of just wanted to start off a little bit um, and tell you a little bit about Los Angeles County in just a couple slides. Oops. So LA County has um, 88 cities within the county, 85 of which contract with LA County Public Health as their health department. Unlike the city of Denver, who has their own health department, most of the cities in LA rely on the county health department to um, provide public health services. We have 124 unincorporated communities, 4,000 square miles, over 10 million people, and one of the most culturally diverse counties in the nation. If you heard Kat talk yesterday, LA, the city of LA by far is our largest city and um, it's just, just very, very large. Now, environmental health is a division within public health. We make up about 25% of the public health department. We have 47 different programs that we're responsible for. I believe, actually, cannabis makes probably the 48th. Um, we have over 900 employees. That's a lot of health inspectors running around. Um, we, have we do approximately 350,000 inspections a year, routine inspections, not counting uh, follow-up and permit investigations and things like that. And our budget is an $80 million budget, which is probably as large as many city budgets in general, and that's just environmental health. So I wanted to give you a perspective because Frankly, most of what you learned today about the challenges and the role of public health, environmental health, in, um, in the cannabis program, you're gonna learn from Denver. 
And believe me, as we built our program, if we didn't have Denver to turn to and go out in the field with and study with, as well as some other, some other jurisdictions, we wouldn't have been um, very successful. In December, um, this past December, our board approved a cannabis ordinance that only addressed the public health's role in cannabis facilities. And the reason I bring this up, I suspect that many of you are from jurisdictions that are not just cities. So in this particular case, the County of Los Angeles has chosen not to move forward allowing cannabis businesses to exist in the unincorporated county. And I am a county employee, environmental health is a county department, yet we're still responsible for the health and safety of 85 cities who may or may not choose to go forward with cannabis programs. The county was generous with us and they gave us um, staffing and money to, not staffing, they gave us the money to um, hire up to 15 full-time equivalent employees. We currently have eight. Um, to, to have its kind of like startup money for the program. Um, we, our primary role is to ensure that the permitted cannabis facilities are in compliance, both with state and the local regulations. We work with the city to develop workflows. Now this is really interesting because um, those of you who have cannabis programs within the city, you work with your fire department, you work with your building and safety and your cannabis program, to figure out where public health fits into that. And at what point do they need to be inspected or how they're going to be inspected? When you have an unincorporated area plus 85 cities, that's a lot more workflows to work through. I'm um, currently, like I, tell, I said, we have 18 cities moving forward. So we sit at the table with those 18 cities and figure out where public health fits into their plans. We don't try to develop the plans because the cities have very robust programs of their own on cannabis, but we try to strategically figure out where public health best fits so that they don't go through the whole process and then public health says, oh, you can't do that, you don't have a three compartment sink. And so we try to work it into the plan, particularly on our plan check, so it all flows really smoothly for the operator. Um, we consult with the cannabis operators, and believe it or not, to date, we probably do more consultation with our operators than we do anything else. So that's probably been our most active role, because most of the operators in LA County believe that um, they may, well, there's a chance that someday they will have to follow all the food code similar or food code food type code regulations in california unlike denver um, cannabis infused products or cannabis inedibles are not considered to be a food product thereby all of our food codes our cal code under the health and safety code considers it to be an adulterated product and we'd have to just throw it all away and obviously that doesn't work. So we refer to those products as edibles and we passed a county ordinance in LA County as well as the state has come up with their, their ordinance which we modeled and made sure that we were in sync with that clearly defines what an edible is and we modeled the requirements of the food code on what we would require to assure public health and safety. So it actually, for the most part, it, it follows the same as other cities and other jurisdictions that have the model food code. We in California have to be different always and we don't use the model food code, we use the California food code. <laughs> Slightly different, but for the most part, very similar. Um, in California, there is dual license approval from both the state and the local jurisdictions, and that typically means a state and a city. But then the health department sits off on the side and works in through the city workflows. Um, I think I've said everything else on there. There's 18 cities. I think I've covered that already. I, um, I, I was tempted not to join in in this discussion today because 
I know less than, um, definitely less than these two folks sitting at the table, probably less than many of you here, but I'm very well versed on the counties on how you get to where you can get a contract for public health services with um, cities and or working with the state. And I thought that might still be valuable information for a lot of you here. And we are currently conducting, um, like I said, the industry um, consult and we are continuing with plan check services. We're doing plan check services now for, the, for about 17 of the 18 cities. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Is this on? You guys hear me? Yes, okay. All right, thank you, Terry. So um, I've got 10 questions prepared that I thought we would just talk as a panel about. So our first one is, what, so Denver's almost in five years, um, uh, January 1st will be five years of legal adult use in our state, and Terry, you're in the first year, right? First year. All right, so what kind of impact has your state's legalization had on your agency? Um, things such as staffing, training, budget, and how did your agency handle this? You want me to go first? Sure. sure. All right. So our agency, um, it did change our agency quite a bit. So we did have, we were conducting some inspections and complaint inspections of medical facilities starting in 2010, but really J January 1st, 2014 is when our world changed. So we had a large influx of people moving to our state, of people opening new businesses in Denver. Um, it's kind of a green rush. And this did change our department. If any of you attended the finance uh, presentation yesterday, they said, which was news to me, they said that they added 58 FTEs to Denver, spread out amongst the divisions. And I believe it said that our, our agency got seven or eight, which I didn't even know until yesterday. So it did change how we operate a little bit because now suddenly we had all these new businesses to inspect. So we took um, just kind of a general approach at first. So um, uh, my colleague Rich is gonna be talking about, and there's an inspection panel coming up at one if you wanna really dig in more into Denver's inspection process. But in general terms, we have D uh, Denver broken up into 15 districts. So we have one investigator per district. So when we started, those investigators are responsible for inspecting all the food facilities in their district. So we just added in the dispensaries and the manufacturing facilities, and that inspector did all of it. So that worked for a little while. And still to this day, our inspectors still do all the dispensaries in their, in their area. But as our program evolved, and as we learned more about the marijuana industry and their processes and how these products are made, um, we realized that a more specialized approach might work better for us. So now we have a marijuana team. So I've got four, here, raise your hands, marijuana team. So now we have a marijuana team. So our marijuana team is made up of our investigators and they all receive some extra training to be able to inspect the manufacturing facilities because our manufacturing facilities are vastly different from one, one another and it's not a one size fits all inspection like a restaurant typically is. So um, this team over here, they do all of our manufacturing inspections and then we've specialized it one step further and have two lead inspectors, raise your hands, Rich and Sheila, those are our two lead investigators. Um, they are our, our highest level investigator for our division, and what they do is more of the um, high level investigations. So if we have contamination issues, it's those two that track down the products and, and work through the recall and do all of that. What else do you guys do? I feel like there's something else. I'm, I feel like there's something big I'm missing. Um, they do, yes? Where do they get that training? From us. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, me, uh, me. There's. Um, I mean, we're we're almost five years in now, so we really have um, evolved our program, and we've learned a lot from the marijuana industry itself. Um, in the beginning, we watched a lot of YouTube videos about how extraction process. I'm not kidding about how in, uh, extraction processes are done, and our knowledge base has increased over the almost five years. So, um, it's our team that's that's training these inspectors to join our marijuana team. Great question. Um, that, I think that's how I was going to answer that question. So yes, it has, it has changed our agency. We've grown and uh, we've taken a bit more of a specialized approach when it comes to regulating um, facilities. Has it, changed, Bill, has it changed your world, Bill? Yeah, for our environmental quality division, again, kind of focusing on the clean air, clean land, clean water, 
Um, not nearly as impactful for us. Um, we have one dedicated inspector um, working on um, routine inspections as well as environmental complaints um, for the Grove facilities. Again, um, early on, the, the biggest issue, the biggest um, impact to us was just the number of environmental complaints we were receiving around odor, um, specifically marijuana odor from our Grove facilities. Um, so as we work through uh, city council and our rules and regulations with our, our board of health, um, that's um, um, addressed a lot of those concerns. So now we're just um, in this routine inspection mode. Uh, when we go out to these facilities, um, we have a, you know, a, a pretty typical um, investigation checklist. Again, we're looking for compliance with their odor control plan. Um, our, in, we have three investigators who, who are trained by the state, um, have certified noses. Um, so um, they're detecting odor at the site boundaries of these facilities and we're using a qualitative scale um, uh, from zero uh, to 10 on the intensity of the odor. And then if they have an approved odor control plan in place, um, we typically see uh, a qualitative odor scale of, of one to two. Um, depending on what's going on with facilities, sometimes a little bit higher than that. But if um, our inspector at the site boundary is, is um, really detecting a, a very intense odor, then we know that there's something wrong or, or something isn't being followed with their odor control plan. And then uh, we, we do a pretty in-depth inspection and to try and identify what it is that's not working with, uh, with their odor control plans. Again, when we're inspecting these facilities, we're also looking for some of those housekeeping things um, around hazardous materials. We're actually inventorying the types of pesticides and herbicides that they're using. Um, and then if we find that they're using a, a, a not an approved pesticide or herbicide, we're re referring that over to CARES team to go out and do a follow-up inspection and, and see if, if uh, we need to do some, some enforcement on that side of things. Um, we're also inspecting for uh, mold. Um, some of these facilities are operating out of older buildings and, and we're really, they weren't designed for this kind of an activity. So sometimes uh, mold can be an issue. And again, those are, are things we'll refer over to Kara to have her team take a look at and, and see if uh, we have a mold issue that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Question? <laughs> and tell us where you're from too I like to know hi I'm short <laughs> I'm, that's not where I'm from um, I'm from Fort Collins ah, and so my go question, Rams yay. yay so my question is about uh, more on uh, sustainability and composting I'm really interested mm. to learn about grows that are actively composting and more specifically with the new rules here at the state with waste, uh, you know, MED rules change quite a bit and then we have new um, policy for our industry that has to change. So the future, especially because we want to reduce our carbon foot footprint, we want to be sus sustainable and you guys are already the leaders in taking these odor action plans, but I'm more curious about is this, do you see the future of it being mandatory to compost so that we can put everything back into our system? Yeah, great, great question. Um, it's a little outside of, of my area of focus, but we do have within our division um, a number of people who are, are focusing on uh, marijuana industry and sustainability and they actually have a working group in place and, and they, they meet um, with the industry um, and kind of work through some best management practices around sustainability and I know composting is one of those things. Um, we do have some information around um, that program on our website, uh, denvergov.org. Um, you can just um, uh, search on marijuana and sustainability. Um, it's an interesting question about whether it would be something that we would um, have be a regulatory requirement down the road. Um, yeah, yeah I, I haven't really thought about that as a possibility, but it's certainly something we could look at. Um, Bill, is your team still using the nasal rangers to assess? Uh, no, assess. I wish you had brought a picture of this. It's pretty entertaining to assess um, odors. <coughs> Can you tell everyone what that is? Are yes, they still using those? Um, so 
Under uh, state regulations um, around odor, um, um, the state really looks at nuisance odor at, at a very um, intense scale. So there, um, the state regulates odor around things like um, hog farms, um, rendering plants, those kinds of things. Very, very intense um, amounts uh, or, or a high level of intensity of odor. So the state requirements um, around that is there's a device called a nasal ranger and um, you hold this device up to your nose and it essentially dilutes the ambient air by a factor, um, different scaling factors. Um, and then if um, you can still detect that odor at a um, dilution factor of seven to one, then you're exceeding state regulatory requirements um, around nuisance odor. That intensity at seven to one dilution is so high that um, it, it's not a very good tool for us to use for marijuana odor or really for almost any odor. It, it, it's very challenging to have something smell so intensely that you can smell it um, when it's diluted seven to one by a factor of seven to one. Um, so it is a tool that we use when we respond to our complaints. We do use um, this instrument um, to, to see if we have a detectable odor at seven to one. Only in, in one case have we ever even been able to detect an odor at a two to one dilution um, for around marijuana. Thank you, Bill. Terry, anything to add about the impact of legalization to your agency? I, I'm Any? sorry. Oh, you've got questions. I thought, I thought he was asking. I didn't hear you, Kara. Oh, I said, do you have anything to add about the, uh, the impact to your agency for after legalization? I, I think in, in California, um, in our environmental health department, we're very specialized already. And so marijuana was no different. I think some of the things that you have to take into consideration, one of the first things we talked about um, was everybody talked about the safety of our employees. We didn't see it as a safety issue um, in terms of inspections, routine inspections. However, we did advocate for and got through our Office of Cannabis Management, I'll give a shout out to Danny who's in the office there, who kind of coordinated the whole county's efforts on cannabis. Um, but we said two things. Number one, as an environmental health inspector, we would not go into a facility that had, hadn't already had um, a clearance from the fire department um, for the safety of our, inspection, our inspectors. And number two was, our board of supervisors is very, very quick to call on environmental health to, to solve their problems because we tend to have a lot of power to resolve issues. So we were already getting called upon illegal complaints of illegal growers or people in homes. And we made it very clear in the very beginning that environmental health would not be responding to any non-permitted facilities without um, being part of an enforcement team, which included often code enforcement and or policing agencies. So those were the two impacts on safety the legislation had on us that I wanna make mention of. We, um, you know, I just have to tell a funny story. Actually, of, we, we made it a voluntary program because there's a stigma. Um, we do the same thing with tattoo parlors and massage parlors. If somebody's not comfortable working in those specialized programs, we don't assign them to those programs. And so we took volunteers for the cannabis program. And I asked them, what are, they, what are their biggest concerns about working in the program? And the biggest concern was smelling like pot in their car and getting pulled over by a cop, number one, and going from work to pick up their kids at school smelling like they just walked out of, you know, smoking pot all the way home. So those were the two biggest impacts that my staff had, how we deal with clearly identifying who they are in the car and um, giving them the ability to um, either change clothes or shower or something before they go pick up their kids at school. The other um, thing that we did in California, we have a very active Environmental Health Directors Association. And when we first got hint of this, we got together statewide and developed a model environmental health ordinance. And we believe in consistency and uniformity to the extent possible in all city, county, and state agencies. So this gave us a base model to work out of, and that was, that was really helpful. 
Um, we can take a couple more questions and we'll get back right, to I'm happy panel. to hold if you if you want to go through yours. But no, I'll, let's mix it up. So, go ahead. Uh, yes. Seth Foldy uh, from Denver Public Health, the Department mm -hmm. of the Health and Hospitals um, Authority and a sister agency to the city. The um, it was something I hadn't thought about. I know the feds are not creating a whole lot of information uh, because of barriers on research and other things, but I hadn't considered whether or not the enforcement of things like TISCA or Right to Know or other federal acts is in a special status when it comes to an industry like cannabis that may not be recognized by the federal government. Uh, a second question, it's a separate question, is are you using kind of hazard analysis critical control point in your new systems and are, are you developing a, a modified methodology to deal with some of the new challenges of cannabis products? That's a great question. I'm not sure if I can answer that adequately because um, that's a great question. Um, I guess I would say that with the lack of federal oversight, we do very much try to model some of our enforcement actions as to how our federal agencies would do that. So if we're doing a, a recall, we certainly model that after how a federal recall would occur. We do a traceback. Um, you know, we, we model it after that, even though we're not getting that assistance or that oversight or that guidance from them. That would be my first, qu I don't know, can you guys answer that any better than that? I'm, I'm pretty sure um, OSHA is, is enforcing their regulations um, for, for these businesses. So if there's OSHA violations under, under federal code, then, then they are enforcing against those. Um, in terms of, for, for, for again, for, for my, uh, my area around the clean air, clean land, the, um, we do use a, um, somewhat of a hazard analysis to identify the facilities that we want to prioritize for inspection. Um, again, anytime we, we've had some complaints, if, if there's some co complaints from a former worker about mold um, or improper management of hazardous materials, hazardous waste, um, we, we, we do have a system where we prioritize um, the facilities that we, we think um, we want to inspect more frequently um, than other facilities. I think any time um, that there's enforcement action taken on any type of activity that's against federal law, there's a very, very tiny risk that um, you still could be considered doing something against the law. Mm -hmm. And um, it's considered a very small risk, and I think it's up to every city and county and state to determine whether or not um, that risk is something big enough for them to consider. But I think always, oh, there you are. <laughs> always it is considered, could be considered aiding and abating, uh, betting and things like that. But I think um, most jurisdictions consider that to be such a small risk, they're not sure, of, they don't do anything about it. In LA County, our attorneys are actually still addressing that issue right now. But it, 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 it I think it's pretty um, standard. I think everybody I've talked to has um, recognizes that it's there. It is a risk. It's very, very small, and they have to make a decision accordingly. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I think I heard that's what you were asking a little bit. Okay, Megan, yes. So Fort Collins interjected the issue of sustainability, and there's something that I want to recommend to cities that are just starting to regulate um, marijuana and are concerned separately about sustainability. In Boulder, what we realized is, as the industry was developing in 2010, Boulder, Colorado, that the industry uses prodigious amounts of energy, so they produce huge amounts of carbon. Um, the grow operations will describe the size of their grow facilities by the number of lights they have, and they'll have a, um, a thousand watt light will illuminate about a, a square meter of their grow operation. <clears throat> So what we did in Boulder is we required the grow operations to offset their carbon production 100% um, in one of two ways. Uh, there, there was an Excel program that was, uh, which is a local power provider, had a program for uh, where you could buy 100% renewable energy from them by paying a 20% premium on the electricity you bought. Or alternatively, the 
um, facilities were able to buy uh, um, RECs, renewable energy credits, to completely offset their carbon. But really, it's very important that cities that are starting out to regulate consider doing that if also sustainability and climate change is an important part of your city's goals. Did you have a question, Megan, or is that just a statement? Just a statement. statement. Thank you. Thank you. We agree. Yes. All right, one more question, then we're going to get back to mine. Yes. <laughs> um, first off. Yes. So far away. Yes. Um, regarding the odor issues, uh, I'm from Humboldt County, and in talking with our air pollution control officer and our own environmental health officer uh, or staff there, um, they've relayed to me that uh, they perceive that there's more of a prospective concern about odor issues with cannabis versus the reality. And um, when they compare it with, you know, they say the real culprits, the ones that they really get a lot of nuisance call complaints about are things like uh, breweries with the odors from the mash there or coffee roasters, which they say are absolutely the biggest, you know, odor offenders uh, in reality, but they don't get that concern up front. People are thinking, oh, coffee, it'll be so great to smell coffee all day. In reality, they hate it. So I'm curious what your experience has been um, regarding it when you, you know, when we try to quantify something as you're talking about with the odor rangers, you know, it's very difficult to quantify the actual nuisance of, of odor. Um, and I'm just curious if you've had similar experiences with that of uh, the reality of cannabis odor being, uh, you know, truly comparable with the concerns in advance. Yeah, <clears throat> um, very similar experiences. Uh, coffee, ro coffee roasters <clears throat> are a big source of our odor complaints, and, and it's true. Um, it's great to smell coffee in the morning every now and again, but um, when it's 24-7, um, it becomes a, a, a very significant uh, quality of life issue. Um, and as well as um, we're seeing an increasing amount of environmental complaints um, from some of our breweries. Um, um, just, just in that process, um, they, they can tend to generate a lot of odor. Again, from, from Denver's perspective, this is all nuisance odor. It's more quality of life than, than actual public health concern. Um, we even get um, nuisance odors from uh, bakeries and donut shops. Um, again, you know, that, that persistent um, exposure to an odor, even if in small amounts it, it's, it's very satisfying, it, it can quickly become a, a quality of life issue for you. Um, marijuana definitely seems to push um, some buttons with the community. Um, um, you know, there's a certain segment that, that enjoys that smell, and there's, there's a segment that um, for a variety of reasons, um, they're very sensitive to it. So um, I, I would say similar experiences. I, I think if, if you had the same intensity of odor from a coffee shop as from a, a marijuana grow facility, you, you would get more complaints from the grow facility. Just for the record, in LA County, we love bakeries <laughs> and donut shops. Our complaints come from garlic and Sirachi businesses. <laughs> oh, interesting. Um, one one in, impact to our, our agency that we hadn't anticipated, um, because of the odor um, that gets on our inspector's clothes, who then gets into um, our city vehicle, we had actually had to dedicate a vehicle. It's our marijuana mobile uh, for doing <laughs> these inspections. Um, we had our executive director, um, um, early on before we had a dedicated uh, vehicle, used one of our vehicles after we had done some inspections and, and he had a meeting with the mayor and, and had to explain why he smelled like marijuana. So shortly after that, we had a ded dedicated uh, marijuana mobile for doing all of our inspections. <laughs> Love it. All right, our next question is, what public health or consumer safety challenges have come up during the course of regulating this industry? that you would not have predicted. So we've already talked through odor. I've touched on some contamination industry um, issues. Do you want me to jump into this or do you guys want to take it first? I'll go. All right, public health and consumer safety issues that have, that have come up that perhaps we would not have predicted. Uh, really the contamination issue has been a big one for us. 
Um, Colorado, are, it's our state agency, the Marijuana Enforcement Agency, that oversees all of the testing rules. Um, there's a lot of testing that goes on. The industry will, is the first to say we, there's a lot of testing. Um, but we're still seeing that contaminated products are making its way to the shelves. So we did go through um, a couple very heavy, busy years with pesticide contamination. This year, we've had more of a focus on microbial contamination, and it's really been quite interesting. And so I wanted to run you through one of our case, cases that we had this year that our team worked on. We received a complaint earlier this year about smoking some pre-rolls, and the complainant stated that they had some respiratory distress issues after smoking these pre-rolls. I believe they were even hospitalized over this. So we opened an investigation, went out to the um, dispensary locations, and issued them a testing order. So we s sampled and tested a variety of pre-rolls, and they came back with very, very high levels of total yeast and mold. So our MED threshold currently is 10,000 colony forming units of total yeast and molds. Some of these pre-rolls were coming back in the hundreds of thousands level. Um, I believe one was even at about a million um, CFUs for total yeast and molds. So we did a, a full recall on this, um, but during the course of our investigation, what we found out I thought was fascinating. So this particular business model, it's a, a large uh, cultivation facility. They send sample jars out to all of their dispensary locations, and these little jars have you know, a couple ounces of different varieties of flour. So as a consumer, you go in, you stick your whole nose in these jars to, and this is part of their business model, to offer up the smell um, and the aroma and you know, what this particular flour um, strain looks like. So they keep these, these sample jars for weeks at a time. They're in a case under a hot light. And then when they've you know, run their life course, these, all these sample jars are sent back to the cultivation facility. And that's the material that they were using to make pre-rolls. So that's a great example of um, a harvest batch at the cultivation level clearly passing the microbial testing requirements from the state. It's tested. It's good to go sent out to the dispensaries, but there's a lot of time that lapses, a lot of handling that, that, ha that occurs between that testing and between what the final product is, which is a pre-roll, which could be months after that initial testing. So this has been kind of an interesting issue that we've worked through as a health department this year. Um, we've had a few microbial cases, but that one is a really interesting one to kind of shed some light on. Um, some, that's definitely something that we would not have predicted um, was happening and it kind of highlights one of the gaps in testing. So that's one of the issues that we've worked through. Um, you want me to just keep talking? I can keep talking. Yeah. Um, let me see. Another, another thing that we probably wouldn't have predicted is how fast this industry innovates. And I know this has been talked about in different panels, um, but from a health department standpoint, it's, it's, they innovate faster than we can regulate. And that's great, it's a fascinating industry. It's an exciting time to be a regulator, I love my job. Um, but it can be hard to keep up with. So one example that our state is looking at and um, us as locals is some of the new products coming out are really more in line with pharmaceutical type products. So we've got your smoking products, we've got your edible products, but a lot of the, the companies now are making all these different products. They're making um, um, eye drops and uh, nasal sprays and inhalers, um, suppositories, you know, things that you would typically put more on the pharmaceutical side of things. And so that really can pose some interesting public health challenges because you look at something like a pharmaceutical product and that has gone through a long, long FDA approval and, um, you know, review process. But that's part of where what we're lacking from a public health federal standpoint. Um, we've got these companies that are just suddenly making eye drops and they're out on in the market. So are there public health concerns with that? And are we the best ones to evaluate that? So that's, that's a, a challenge that I, I don't think we would have predicted. So um, the odor issue, was that something that, that you guys would have predicted or is that something that kind of came about? Yeah, I, I'd like to say we were, were prepared and, and knew it was coming, but we, uh, we were wildly unprepared for um, the community um, concerns over the odor. Um, I guess <clears throat> one thing that we didn't um, predict, um, very similar kind of theme around mold in some of the grow facilities. Um, 
when we do identify mold, um, trying to find a solution, work with the facility to find a solution to, to abate the mold um, can be challenging. It, you know, the, the things that we would typically tell a, a client to do to um, get rid of the mold um, is potentially very damaging to, to a very expensive um, product and, and to their crops. And so trying to find a way um, to, to mitigate the mold um, while the crops are in the room and, and growing um, um, it can be really challenging and solutions are always very very situational but we we really did a lot of head scratching to try and, and come up with some solutions for some of these facilities who who had some minor mold conditions that we wanted to get in, in front of before they potentially um, impacted their product um, but trying to abate that mold without impacting um, or damaging their their crops was uh, um, is challenging now remember, we're about five years behind Denver, and so I, I'm guessing you guys experienced this as well, but the one thing we didn't anticipate um, through environmental health was that same level of innovation except where they sell the product. Um, you know, we're just getting a grip on um, things like pop-up kitchens, but now we have pop-up kitchens selling marijuana products, and I'm like, what? You're not supposed to do that till we get the grip on the pop-up kitchens first. You know, on hot food trucks, on products being um, commingled with um, regular restaurant products. So we weren't quite prepared for that. And, um, and then the rules are sometimes different in every city. And so we have to have our inspectors well versed on what the rules are in each of the cities, which um, makes it challenging. Now in California, starting January 1st, there's micro enterprise home kitchens that are gonna be allowed for uh, restricted food service in homes, which we believe and anticipate will also be a challenge for us with marijuana. Interesting, I read about that, Terry. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, our next question, I do wanna uh, definitely bring up the topic of hemp. Uh, hemp is a booming industry right now. Uh, it's currently experiencing huge growth. And the question is, does your agency regulate hemp and hemp products the same as marijuana and marijuana products? And are there any issues? So I will start. Uh, yes, our agency does regulate hemp and marijuana products the same. In our view, from a public health lens, the risks associated with those products are the same. So the plants are very similar, the products created and the extraction processes are very similar. And so from a public health standpoint, we do view that as having the same risks. Um, the hemp industry, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the legality of hemp is murky. It's confusing state to state. We're all closely watching the farm bill. If it becomes federally legal, that might change some things. That's kind of exciting to, to think about. Um, but as it stands now, it, it poses a challenge for our agency, just um, going back to that basic, basic approved source issue. So to bring up another example, our, our investigators inspected a, I think it was Rich actually, inspected a manufacturing facility. Oh, it was Rich and I inspected a manufacturing facility months and months ago they were infusing some of their edible products with a CBD ingredient. However, they had no information on this CBD ingredient. There was no invoice, there was no label, um, so Rich and I placed a lot of product on hold that day because they had this one unapproved ingredient. So to us, that's a basic unapproved source problem. So that particular, those particular products, though, were on hold for months because Rich had such a difficult time tracing back that product to the original manufacturer for us to find out if it is under any sort of health and sanitation regulation. So, um, you know, that product was handled, my goodness, like five or six times before it reached the manufacturing facility in Denver where we found it. There were brokers involved. There was one facility that made the crude oil. There was another facility that made the distillate. Then it went to this broker. Then it was stored at this facility. It was really challenging for Rich to trace that back and that took that hold took months so this was a large manufacturer in denver that had a number of products on hold because of this one ingredient so hemp has posed some challenges like that for us whereas the marijuana industry does not we can easily trace back marijuana products they're all in colorado um, it's all nicely traceable back to the manufacturer back to the cultivation um, the hemp industry is not so easy for us to track and every state and every jurisdiction is different with how they're handling hemp. So in Colorado, our state health department registers these folks as wholesale food manufacturers. So that just started last year. 
So that's another nice thing for us if the hemp is coming from Colorado and it's been being made into some sort of food extract or a food ingredient, we can trace it back to our state health department and see that it's registered and, and regulated. But you know, each state is different. So hemp has proved to be uh, a challenge for us and it's um, it really, it can be, it sometimes eats up quite a bit of our time because it's in a lot of products. We've got coffee shops making hemp lattes. We've got a restaurant that's got a full um, CBD menu. Um, so that's all become part of our inspection process now. Where did that CBD ingredient come from? Is it, is it an approved source? So that's something that we're really looking at. Any other, uh, what was my question? Oh, comments on hemp? Terry, is hemp something that you guys are looking at yet or no? No? We're not quite there yet. Not quite there. <laughs> not quite there yet. We yeah. anticipate all the same, same things you just talked about. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's a, just a fine line. If it's infused in a food product, then it, it falls under our cow code. If it's not, we don't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. And so it's a real challenge on how to change the regulations and the rules to, um, to fairly regulate all of it. Bill, any comments on hemp? Yeah, we regulate it um, in these grow facilities exactly the same as marijuana. Um, so it, it's the same for us. Okay, I think I'll do one more question, then I'll open it back up to audience questions. Um, are there any emerging public health issues in this, in this industry that your agency has identified? You want me to go? I'll jump in. We'll let you start, Kara. <laughs> <laughs> All right, emerging public health issues. Yes, um, you know, we're almost in, in year five of our program, and really every year has brought a new level of understanding for us. So when we first started inspecting facilities, it was pretty basic. We were using our food regulations. Uh, we added the word marijuana to our definition of food, and voila, our, our whole set of food regulations now applies to the marijuana world. So we inspect these facilities through that lens, you know, through the lens of food safety. Um, but as we've evolved and understand the, the industry more and their processes more, um, you know, that has brought on a new, some, some new, you know, emerging areas of public health. Um, I did already touch on the alternative use products. Um, this is something that we're kind of looking at now. So suppositories and eye drops and, you know, are these things safe? Um, what about all these added ingredients that are being added to the vaping products? Um, there's cutting agents being added to these to, you know, change the viscosity so that the, the oil can run through the vape pen. Um, there's flavoring agents. Uh, there's non-cannabis derived terpenes being added to these. You know, what, what are the, what's the public, is there a public health impact of smoking those things, of heating that and vaporizing it or smoking it? We don't know that. Um, so one of the things that we've done as an agency is we have developed what we call our Cannabis Health and Safety Advisory Committee. And this is um, kind of an attempt to, to recreate some, like a federal oversight piece. So we've convened um, a number of people on this committee and they come from all different backgrounds. We've got labs, um, different sorts of scientists and chemists. Uh, we've got professors in botany. Uh, we've got industry representatives and experts, um, let's see, a patient advocate. So we've put together this, this really well-rounded group to help us um, tackle some of these issues and to help advise our agency on some of these issues that we are struggling with, like added ingredients to vape, vape pens would be an example. So that's one way that we've tried to kind of wrap our heads around some of these emerging health emerging health issues that are not really in our wheelhouse. Uh, I think that's all. Emerging health issues? Um, we, um, something that's emerging for us um, around um, nuisance odor is uh, these social consumption clubs. Mm -hmm. So um, Colorado regulations prohibit um, smoking under our, our clean indoor air quality um, um, requirements. And so social consumption um, would look something like smoking on an outdoor um, patio area at, at, a, at a business. Um, controlling odor um, within a, a fixed facility with walls and ventilation systems fairly easy to do. Trying to do that on an open patio 
um, potentially very close to residential areas um, is quite challenging. So um, that's it's an emerging issue. We, we actually have had several proposals from social consumption clubs about some different ideas and technologies around it. We've yet to see anything actually constructed and implemented and, and effective, but it's definitely, um, it's gonna be challenging for these businesses to, to figure a way to control the odor um, um, from smoking outside on these patios. Again, it's a little too early for me to identify any emerging public health issues from industry, but I have to take advantage of this opportunity to say that from my perspective, not having a public health program or oversight within your cannabis programs is a public health issue. And even though it's worked out really easily for Denver, because of being a city, it's, I suspect it's not that easy with all of you. And in LA County, that's one of our biggest challenges, and we believe a threat to public health, is that it's really important from the perspective of public health that there is some oversight on the on the food safety mm -hmm. type side of it and and we're very much an advocate for everybody starting a new program to make sure your public health department is included in those um, regulatory oversight programs do we have some more audience questions yes Hi, um, I'm Alex Rubin with Craft uh, Concentrates, uh, do compliance. I have a, actually a couple questions for you guys, if that's all right. Um, so you were saying that there's there was 80 recalls for pesticides. Is that post August 1st uh, required pesticide testing? No, no, that's over uh, the five years of our okay. Of our so, program. and they so, haven't all been for pesticides. They've been a couple have been for microbials, a couple have been for ingredients added to edibles that were not intended to be food ingredients. They're not all pesticides, but the majority are. Okay, and then how many, have you, have you seen an increase in pesticide recalls since the August 1st testing, mandatory testing? We've done none since okay. then. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, have you guys done any internal research in um, on-shelf edibles um, for shelf life in terms of keeping edibles in your guys' you know, hands for year, year and a half, two years, and, and doing any kind of testing on that um, for we shelf have life? Not. Okay. We have not, but I know the industry does shelf life testing, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. There's like a year requirement that mm. it's a year best by date um, for that, depending on the, on, on the edible for sure. Um, so we, we kind of vaguely talked about recycling um, and sustainability as well. Does the city, um, you know, have any ideas for raw waste from these, um, these cultivations? There's currently eight ways to make your waste unusable and unrecognizable. Um, plastic waste, though, is one of those. Oil waste is one of those as well. Um, I, I don't see that being the most sustainable recycling waste um, available. Um, is there any kind of city program that is that has come up and I, as an idea to um, obtain that kind of recycled waste um, or to, to be able to put that into um, recycling or uh, other cultivations? Yeah, I'm not sure um, if um, our sustainability work group has, has worked on that yet or not. Um, that's, that's a good question. Cool. Um, the other, sorry. <laughs> um, I have another question about residual solvent testing for flour. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any notion for residual solvents for raw material um, testing? Um, a couple of manufacturers have been testing the flour before they're even putting it in their concentrates and have found that residual solvents are coming from agricultural chemicals that are not being tested on the raw material end. Is that something that you guys are considering doing as well? So that that is uh, something that we hadn't considered until your um, business brought that to our attention. So that's not something that we even knew was a problem. Um, if any of you came to the previous panel, our director, Danica, did mention the baseline study that we are working on. Um, that We are going to be looking at residual solvents, but I don't think with flour. Um, maybe you could give us a better idea. Do you think this is a, um, a large problem or uh, an isolated issue? It's an issue on the manufacturing issue? side. Maybe you could explain for everybody. <laughs> sure. It, it's a unique issue and not one that you, would, you wouldn't associate residual solvents with flour. You wouldn't. Um, a lot of the... Or some of the agricultural chemicals don't necessarily put all of the ingredients 
on their agricultural chemicals. So there can be isopropanol, there can be res other residual solvents on some of the flour. So for a concentrate manufacturer, they're going to be concentrating that raw flour in which if there was any residual solvents, well, that test might be coming up higher regardless of what the um, production is or the, um, the procedure itself. So then when it's that raw concentrate is then getting tested, it's coming up hot for residual solvents, but it's not the manufacturer itself mm -hmm. that is not doing that appropriately. It's actually the raw flour that they're obtaining from cultivations around, around the state. Um, so I think that that is an issue for manufacturers that when we're producing the oil, we are subject to residual solvent testing, though the raw cannabis material isn't, in which if we have that raw cannabis material and then concentrating it in to an oil, well, those residual solvents can go up in concentration as well. And I think mm -hmm. that that is an issue that we should bring up um, for further testing of, of raw cannabis material. I would agree. One more comment on that before sure. your next part. <laughs> um, our baseline study might indirectly address that because um, we are going to be doing a number of, of different samples uh, among the different products. So we're going to be looking at, at flour and pre-rolls and concentrates. So the concentrates that are created with hydrocarbons, we are going to be looking to get those tested for residual solvents. So your question might be answered in an indirect fashion because if the plant material used to make that hydrocarbon extract has residual solvents that might show up in the final testing. I do see what you're saying though. Who's the culprit? I see what you're saying. Right. I don't know that our, our baseline study is going to address that. So maybe our, our advice to you would, as an industry folk might be to conduct your own testing on, on the plant material prior to. We have been. <laughs> you have been, yes. which is why you're bringing this to our attention. I right. get it. So yes. um, my last question yeah. is resolving uh, or um, involving public health. Um, in terms of remediation of products, um, some people in this room not, might not understand, but um, if a microbial testing comes up hot um, for yeast and mold um, above 10,000 CFUs, they can uh, CFUs, they can get retested, um, or after that retest is then failed, it can go to a remediation for a hydrocarbon um, extraction. Um, however, that remediated product isn't labeled on the packaging for any kind of product. It, in theory, it's supposed to kill off all of the mold. It's supposed to, you know, the product's supposed to be as clean as possible. Though, as a public health standard, I personally would enjoy understanding what products I'm consuming. And if that concentrate or edible came from a grow that did have remediate or had failed microbial testing, I might want to know that this is remediated material. Mm -hmm. um, there are many, many sensitive people out there that consume a various amount of different products. And if in the event, you know, not everything has come out of that remediated material, um, I think it would be a, a decent public safety issue that, that people just would want to know what products have been remediated and what products are, you know, test passed on the first try every time. So, Our agency uh, and me and my agency would agree with that. I mean, that's kind of a truth and labeling type thing. And I would agree that the consumer probably has the right to know that. Um, that, that topic, though, would probably be better answered by the MED um, because the MED does does dictate what's on those labels. Um, I think that's a great point, though, and I would agree with you. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What other public health questions do we have? Burning food safety questions for us? Yes. Hi, afternoon. Peter Oshiro from the Department of Health, State of Hawaii. So that we're, uh, interesting about the remediation talk. We're looking at that kind of issues here in Hawaii also. Do you have approved remediation processes for flour? I mean, yeah, for flour that has failed microbial testing. Actually, maybe he should stand back up and yeah, talk sure. about that. So, the, so that, that the, is in our MED rule, but I'm not well versed. Sure, yeah. The, the, so it's 10,000 CFUs mm -hmm. is the approved amount. If it is so a process, you have an approved remediation process. So it's a hydrocarbon, it must be subject to a hydrocarbon. Um, mm -hmm. You get the validation study, so that is yep. okay. Concentrate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can remediate that by using a hydrocarbon extraction method. Um, one other public health issue that we have is that in the MED rule is a mycotoxin test 
after that. However, we, we have an issue with the labs now because the labs are not certified to run that test yet. So from a public health standpoint, that would be um, kind of some nice insurance to know that there's not mycotoxins present in that end product that was remediated because it started with moldy plant material. So it does make you concerned about mycotoxins from a public health standpoint. So that's in MED rule, but that is currently not being enforced right now. And those, uh, those remediated products are also subject to microbial testing afterwards as well. So. Is that always allowed in Denver, or is that um, part of that regulatory change that's going on? Did you always allow um, establishments, grows to remediate product that had failed, or would you force them to destroy the product at that point, or did you always let them push the product forward? So that rule is, a, is an, it is our state level rule. Um, I'm actually not clear on how long it's been allowed. Do you know? I believe it's two years. Okay. Any other questions for our panel? All right. Yes. Um, Travis Blon with the Tulsa Health Department um, mm -hmm. in Oklahoma. Um, when it comes to microbial testing um, for the infused products, the edibles, um, have you guys had any recalls due to anything besides the um, Clostridium botulinum, like uh, Listeria or any other um, microbial concerns? We have not. The only edible products that we have recalled, I believe there was a couple for pesticides, and there were a couple edible products. Um, because our investigators during routine inspections uh, of a couple of our manufacturers in Denver found that they were using flavoring agents that were not manufactured with the intent of being consumed. Um, some of these flavoring agents, when we traced them back, were actually aromatherapy oils. So we did do, I believe, two recalls for edible products for that reason. Uh, we have not recalled edible products for microbials, no. Other questions for us? We got, Kira, yes. um, do you guys do any random sampling in your routine inspections? We don't now, but that is something that we are looking towards. Um, Danica mentioned it in the last panel. We are currently working on um, conducting what we're, what we're calling a baseline contamination study. Uh, we have received, we've secured some funding to do this. We are hoping to roll this out in the next couple months. We're right now at the plan of building an analytical model and, and plan that we're working with our um, sister agency, the Denver Public Health. We're working with, with the epidemiologist in that department to make sure our plan is tight before we roll this out. But we're looking to collect um, about 100 random samples from dispensaries. So these are products on the shelf. We're looking to sample flour and um, pre-rolls and various concentrates solventless concentrates and hydrocarbon concentrates. And we're gonna have all these products tested for a variety of contaminants, um, pesticides, microbials, and residual solvents. Thank you. We're working on it. We'll probably talk about that next year at this conference. Yes. Other questions for us? All right, we're ending 11 minutes early. Um, thank you all so much for um, being engaged with us and listening to our presentation today. Thank you. Thank you.